Hello. Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Mark Erickson. Mark is a family law attorney whose firm is located in Campbell, California. He graduated with a JD or law degree from Santa Clara University School of Law in 1979. He was admitted to the California State Bar and U.S. District Court, Northern District of California in 1979. After working for another attorney, mostly in the areas of civil and business litigation from 1979 through 1984, he founded his own law firm in 1985. He became a certified family law specialist by the Board of Legal Specialization of the State Bar of California in 1987. He has lectured and presented seminars for many groups, including as a teaching assistant and guest lecturer at the Santa Clara University School of Law. And Mark has two adult sons, and one of them is working with him as an attorney in his law practice, which is pretty exciting. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to work with a diverse attorney cost effectively. Uh, I want you to also be aware that some previous interviews with Mark about divorce basics, choosing a good divorce lawyer, Spousal support, child custody, and handling a family business and residence in a divorce are posted under past episodes at our website, financialinsiderweekly.com. So that's becoming quite a, a resource uh, for people on divorce topics. And I have some other uh, uh, interviews with some other attorneys on related topics as well. Mark, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Okay. So are there steps that a party to a divorce, to a divorce can do to control their legal expenses? There's no question. There are things people can do to keep their legal expenses under control. Um, they may do things sometimes that they think are helpful mm -hmm. that are not, um, and there are things they can't control, it's, and it's often the adverse party, your spouse mm -hmm. or former spouse, uh, often is the creator of unnecessary fees and costs, although there's some things you can do to try and keep your uh, spouse or former spouse under control so they're not wasting a lot of your money on attorney's fees and costs that are avoidable. Mm -hmm. Okay. How can spouses prepare in advance to control their legal costs? Okay. Well, let's start with the initial interview. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people come in sometimes very unprepared mm -hmm. and sometimes they're very well prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have an existing case and, and that's very common and when people come in to see me. Maybe they were divorced years ago and there's some sort of a post-judgment motion. Bring your paperwork in. Mm -hmm. uh, because what I find is most people are not um, terribly knowledgeable about what's going on in their case. They may not really understand uh, the details of an existing court order or which court order is in effect at the time. So bring your papers with you. Uh, a lawyer can sort through uh, an inch of papers and get a lot of information in maybe 10 or 15 minutes that might otherwise take you hours and hours to tell your story. Mm -hmm. And your story may not be exactly what that lawyer needs to know to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, so bring existing paperwork. If it's a, a beginning of a divorce case and you are going to have questions about income, bring your tax returns, uh, bring your pay stubs and your spouse's pay stubs because then the attorney will have some numbers to work with and perhaps could give some estimates on what child or spousal support orders might be. Um, as far as property, if you have any spreadsheets and some people, I, I know engineer clients are mm -hmm. great at preparing spreadsheets mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people now are really great with Excel and they keep good records. Uh, bring in your list of property with your estimated values. If you have any appraisals, bring those in. If there are uh, particular documents that you think may be important uh, because you expect there's going to be a, a dispute about ownership of real property, uh, bring in the deed, bring in closing statements from when you purchased or sold property, things like that. Uh, I always say, if in doubt, bring it, uh, throw it in a box, put it in your trunk, and you can run out to your car and get it if uh, it would be helpful during the interview. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. What information are both spouses required to disclose? 
well, the law um, it gives both spouses an absolute duty and a continuing duty from the beginning of the dissolution case until all of the assets are divided, awarded, and distributed uh, to make a full disclosure of all material facts and information concerning the existence and value of assets and debts, as well as a full and immediate disclosure of income, all income, and any changes in income. Now, not everyone complies with this, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I've heard some lawyers say, the minute you file for a divorce, you're in violation of the law because you didn't make a full and immediate disclosure. That's a little bit extreme, uh, but depending on the nature and complexity of your assets, uh, it's probably a good idea to make the best full disclosure that you can as quickly as you can because there can be serious sanctions for failure to fulfill those obligations. It's also going to be helpful to your attorney to make them as fully informed as possible early on so they can spot issues and help you get prepared. Yeah, I, I'm sure that there gets to be a problem as selective compliance uh, uh, with these things and it can, I think it can probably create a problem for the attorney of the client as well as, you know, for the other spouse and the other uh, aside. So. I like that term, selective compliance. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> I we, accountants are very yeah. good at understanding yeah. things like that. <laughs> we, we would call it, yeah, fa failure to disclose or concealment <laughs> or breach of fiduciary duty. Um, and, and the consequences can be severe, and, and it is not uncommon. Uh, there's certainly a significant amount of litigation in family law cases uh, that involves someone's failure to fulfill their duties to fully and accurately disclose, uh, which can lead to not only losing on particular issues in court, uh, but the court can impose serious financial sanctions upon an offending party. Okay. So keeping good records could probably be pretty, be pretty helpful in this process. Keeping good records is very important, and what I've found uh, as the years have gone on, people are not as good at record keeping as they used to. They tend to rely on their computer, uh, their cell phone, or wherever they have their banking records. They don't keep their bank statements. Uh, when I first started, it seemed like people always had all the documents from whenever they purchased their home. Uh, they had their canceled checks. They had old bank statements. And, and now uh, they, I see a lot of folks that have valid claims that they're unable to prove because they don't have the documentation. Uh, so preserve your documentation, that's certainly important. Um, also, sometimes people have their documentation at the beginning of the dissolution, but somehow it disappears when it's been in the hands of uh, your adversary who would uh -oh. be disadvantaged if you had those papers. So uh, people that are thinking about um, potential end to their marriage, it would be a good idea to preserve your paperwork and make sure it's in a place of safekeeping where it won't get lost. Mm -hmm. So this brings to mind a couple of things. So one, I've done uh, some uh, interviews with uh, a Red Cross representative and they talk about you know preparing for a disaster. So in a sense, divorce is a disaster. And so we've talked about, for example, you know, making a CD uh, that you may keep in a safe deposit box or some other safe place, maybe in several safe places uh, that have things like your wills and you know key documents uh, and so forth uh, scanned and, and placed on them. So in preparation, like we said, uh, for a divorce, it may be a good idea to put something like that together. It, it would be a good idea and certainly keep track of uh, any major transactions, particularly house purchases and sales, and including uh, assets that you own before marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where people often have not retained old documents from before marriage that might prove separate property claims. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning that people don't keep, you know, bank statements and checks. Well, one thing is, is that the banks aren't making these available on hard copy so much to people. I mean, you have to request or insist on it, which I do, by the way, uh, for my personal stuff. But uh, even then, I mean, you know, you could have a situation, let's say, uh, again, we're arguing over these bank accounts, somebody changes passwords, you can't get access to your bank account. 
online? I mean, oh my goodness. So, and if um, you you need to subpoena records from um, mm -hmm. financial institutions, which we frequently do, that's expensive. They, yeah, they, it's, it can be very expensive, and um, people that are subpoenaed are not always terribly cooperative, and the records only go back so far. So, mm -hmm. you know, very commonly we're looking for records that are. 10 or eight more years old, and the banks or other financial institutions do not retain them. Right, right. So something to think about, folks, uh, as far as uh, what are you getting now and what are you keeping now. Okay, um, how about key purchase documents? So, uh, Well, I, I mentioned uh, family residence, mm -hmm. which is a, an ish, a, a property um, commonly held in uh, during a marriage, and it's an area where there's often disputes about ownership or what we call reimbursement claims. So a very common scenario is the spouses get married and one of them had a house before marriage. It ends up being sold during the marriage and the money from the sale is used for the down payment on the house that the marital couple buy together during the marriage as community property. Well, if that spouse can show that they contributed their separate property for the down payment, they're entitled to reimbursement at the time of a dissolution of marriage. But if they don't have the records to show it, uh, even though they may know it happened, uh, they're not going to be able to prove it. And unless the other side voluntarily agrees, uh, you're not going to be able to establish that claim. So I, I certainly would retain all records of purchase and sale of property, including canceled checks, um, checks, copies of checks received from the uh, net proceeds of sale, and then the bank records showing where those checks are deposited, um, and hopefully they haven't been commingled into a joint account. That's another thing to mm -hmm. think about is mm -hmm. if you have separate property, maintaining it in separate accounts in your own name. And very commonly, we see people have um, not thought during the marriage about preserving their separate property. The marriage ends, and then they want to claim that they had money that belonged to them exclusively, either from before marriage or they received it by gift or inheritance during the marriage, but they didn't maintain it in a separate account. Once the money's commingled, you're going to have um, greater complexities in your divorce case and there are some strict rules on what you would need to do to trace that money and sometimes people just can't do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So but part of what I'm hearing in there is okay we talk about separate property um, and maybe evidence of whether it's separate property so what sort of documents or what have you might you have related to that? Well, like I said, bank records, um, of course a deed, you know, there's a, a presumption of title set forth in a deed to real property, uh, although we often have uh, conflict over whether uh, title changes during the marriage were made freely and voluntarily. Mm -hmm. there's a, the law says there's a presumption of undue influence where one spouse gains an advantage over the other spouse in a transaction. And very commonly you're dealing with real property where uh, the title has changed from sole and separate property of one spouse to community property or the other way it's community property changed to separate property in the time of divorce. Uh, the wronged spouse or the loser spouse in that transaction uh, claims that it was not fair and forces the other person to uh, carry their burden of overcoming the presumption of undue influence. So you'd want to have all the documentation relating to that transaction, certainly any collateral agreements, um, any uh, um, money that might have been paid incident to the transaction, whether uh, debts were paid off, collateral agreements with family members that may have been involved in a transaction. I'm just thinking of, uh, I've just been involved in uh, administering the trust myself, and one of the things that I, I did was I made receipts up basically uh, when I was distributing checks, you know, I received from you uh, X dollars, you know, uh, as part of my inheritance related to such and such trust. So, and I gave a copy of those to the beneficiaries. So I would think that would be a document that a beneficiary might want to retain. 
and then uh, show, you know, again, it went maybe into a, a separate bank account that they're holding those funds in, or maybe a brokerage account or whatever that is going to be their separate property investment account. Uh, that, that was good advice. That's a good point. And, and we often see people commingle inheritance money and, and they don't maintain records. They know they received it, but years later they're not able to show where it is now and, or take a current asset and show that it was derived from something be, uh, received by gift or inheritance. Okay. Well, we need to move along. Uh, how can requests for information or discovery result in high legal fees? Well, we talked about the requirement of making a disclosure, which is supposed to be voluntary, mm -hmm. uh, but people don't always make adequate disclosure. And so the law, just like in any civil case, in a family law case, the discovery rules are the same. You are permitted to send written interrogatories, uh, document inspection demands, request for admissions, and take depositions. All of these things can be very expensive. Uh, so first, I would always try and promote voluntary disclosure, and uh, I suppose you, know, you, you have to trust the other side sometimes if you're relying entirely on voluntary disclosure. Was it uh, um, Ronald Reagan used to say, trust but verify. Uh -huh. um, so you may do uh, a bit of each and, and uh, engage in formal discovery, uh, but do so wisely only where you need to do it. Um, certainly some folks will overdo the discovery. You know, they'll send massive uh, quantities of uh, document requests, requesting hundreds of pages of documents and asking for bank records going back throughout the whole marriage or back before marriage, uh, things that may not be uh, at all relevant uh, or in any way be expected to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So if you receive if you're on the receiving end of what you think is an excessive request, there are things you can do uh, in court to try and um, uh, deflect those things away by getting protective orders, getting orders from the court about whether you actually have to respond to these things or to what extent. So just because you get a subpoena doesn't mean that you have to respond to that subpoena. Well, you're either going to respond to the subpoena or you're going to seek uh, an order from the court yeah. uh, quashing the subpoena so you right. don't have to respond to it. Right. Now, uh, I guess you could also have to get other professionals involved like uh, forensic accountants and uh, private investigators, people like that. No question we use uh, forensic accountants frequently in family law cases. Uh, I, sometimes our clients will want me or the lawyers that work for me to work with the numbers, and, and in some cases, I'll say, you know, we could probably do just a, as good of a spreadsheet as the accountant would do, but we can't be a witness. Mm -hmm. um, so even uh, sometimes in things that may not be terribly complex, it may be better to have an outside accountant do it because the, if there's a dispute, you have a witness that can come to court and testify in the witness stand to support your claims. And then in some areas where you need expert, uh, true expert opinion testimony, you need accountants or other competent experts uh, to both form their opinions and be prepared to present them to the court if you've got a contested issue that requires expert testimony, such as uh, the value of a business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, so there's a whole other area. So business valuation specialists, appraisers, and so forth. So we get all the party of, a big party of uh, uh, people here to get, that may be necessary in some cases in order to work these things through. Uh, what if information isn't provided on time? Well, if it's a formal discovery, you know, there are some strict time limits uh, within which uh, the responding party is required to respond. Uh, also, the um, completeness of their response is required. If uh, you are the um, sender of uh, interrogatories or some form of discovery and you're not satisfied with the responses, uh, the law says you're first required to meet and confer and try and resolve the dispute with the other side. If you're unable to resolve the dispute, you then file a motion to compel and the court at that point, if they grant the motion, has authority to sanction the other side with financial sanctions, usually in the form of attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe we can go into a little more detail related to that. 
uh, when, what sort of situations we, do we have where a person could be fined or have some sort of sanctions? Um, I, it's one of my favorite old ones, it was uh, the other side, the attorney was uh, a civil litigator. I don't think he did much family law and he was playing hardball on uh -huh. everything. Uh -huh. One of the things we asked for was uh, copies of the, his client's uh, state and federal income tax returns. And the response was, uh, we object, we're not going to give them to you under the, I think they called it the taxpayer right of privacy. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in family law, uh, in a divorce case, both spouses are absolutely entitled to receive tax returns from the other side. Mm -hmm. It could be their own joint tax returns or separate returns filed by their spouse, or it could be post-separation, separately filed tax returns. You have an absolute right to those returns to prepare your case, but yet um, I've seen probably at least a half dozen times where people have put up resistance all the way going to the court and making the judge make a decision, in which case they were always sanctioned. Hmm. What, sort of, what are the sanctions like? I mean, how does that work? Well, um, sometimes judges are very kind uh, when it comes to an initial sanction. So if it's not viewed as a terribly expensive problem, um, a sanction might be 500 or or $1,000. But I, well, last year I had a sanction against someone who was really playing games, uh, didn't disclose some foreign assets uh, based on the claim that um, this is an American court I don't believe I'm required to disclose my foreign assets. Uh, the sanction was in the range of $150,000 payable by that person to, in behalf of my client toward her attorney's fees and costs. Um, so the sanctions can be very severe, not only financial, but if you continue to uh, uh, fail to comply with those rules, the court can uh, make what are called issue sanctions that prevent you from presenting certain claims in the case, which can turn it into essentially a default case. Okay. Um, how can uh, picking your battles help to control costs? Uh, no question. That's a huge <laughs> issue in family law because emotions can run high and people are often willing to fight about uh, issues that outsiders might think are trivial but they seem very important to the people going through a divorce at the time. Um, you know, they'll, in a child custody case, they'll make a big issue about whether the uh, pickup of a child should occur uh, at 545 or at 6 o'clock. Um, should it occur at the school, uh, on the playground, or should it be at the front door of the school? Um, can I take my child uh, for spring break for six days? Uh, or seven days. You know, can I take my child out of state uh, into Nevada for spring break? Um, and people will spend a lot of money even though there may be no real significant long-term consequence uh, to either party, but because their emotions uh, get involved in it, they can be very willing to spend a lot of money uh, fighting those types of battles. And uh, as lawyers will often tell people, Please, pick your battles carefully, uh, but as an attorney, you can't always talk your client out of pursuing a, a course of action that you don't think is cost-effective or truly in their interests. So let's say we have a couple that's thinking, okay, we're, we're going to call it quits, but they decide for whatever reasons, really, I guess you could say, to be fairly cooperative with each other. In other words, they can walk in to uh, with their attorneys or meet with their attorneys and they more or less have a plan, things are pretty well defined and so forth. Can they get through this process much less expensively? No question about it. Um, and now sometimes they may have a misconception. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes people believe mm -hmm. they, they have an agreement and then when uh, one person get some legal advice and they find out that they may be making a huge mistake, they've mm -hmm. overlooked an important issue or maybe they are going to um, have a, a, a bad tax consequence as a, bad, as a part of that decision and something they didn't consider. 
now the deal falls apart and they're in worse shape than oh, they, they started with. <laughs> okay. So you want to be careful. I always tell people, be careful about committing to an agreement before mm -hmm. you really understand it. Mm -hmm. But if, if truly it, it makes sense, uh, or people sometimes make concessions as long as they understand what they're doing, uh, it can be a, a way of making things uh, a lot quicker and much less expensive and um, less painful than the alternative of uh, ongoing expensive litigation. Okay. So we really only have probably a couple minutes left, so I'll warn you because I'm going to drop this uh, question and I need for you to try to be somewhat brief. But anyway, what can be done when the attorney for the other spouse is being non-cooperative resulting in big legal fees? Well, the, uh, there's certainly a body of law that um, permits under certain circumstances for attorneys to be sanctioned. So it is possible for attorneys to be financially sanctioned based on their bad conduct during the case, and it does happen. Um, and uh, more often than you would think, and uh, typically the sanctions, at least initially, are small unless it's some terrible transgression. Uh, because if the sanction is $1,000 or more, there's a mandatory uh, reporting to the state bar, which right. means there could be disciplinary proceedings on top of the sanction. Yuck. Well, Mark, we're about out of time. So um, I want to thank you so much for joining me today nice. as nice being to my guest and sharing this very important information. Uh, folks, uh, you may be in a situation yourself uh, where you have to deal with an attorney or you may have a friend uh, that's wrestling with this. And uh, this uh, interview will be posted on YouTube. Uh, it will be under past episodes at our financialinsiderweekly.com website. So uh, you can refer people to it. And I think it will be a helpful uh, place to get uh, maybe a little start uh, in getting into this process. With that, we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.